Exodus chapter 20 this morning, so big chapter. I think it's uh, safe to say that uh, Exodus chapter 20 is the center of Exodus in more ways than one. Exodus is uh, 40 chapters long, so chapter 20 is, you know, at least roughly the center. I think it's also safe to say that everything that's happened up until this point in Ephesus has been preliminary to this moment, and that what happens from this point on is the unpackaging of, this, of the implications of God giving the Ten Commandments to His people. We have uh, talked about the imagery here, especially the marriage imagery. God has rescued these people, brought them to this place, proposes to them, they've accepted, and these are the marriage vows. And so God has made promises to them to distinguish these people, to make them a special people, and they make promises to Him to honor Him by virtue of these Ten Commandments. My plan is not to cover all of this today, but to do a little bit of a kind of overview, and as time permits. My understanding is the class will continue for two more weeks after today. I'm getting more, one more week than I expected, so I'm happy. So uh, we meet today, then two more weeks, and so my general plan is to next week focus on the first table of the Ten Commandments, the first four, and then the week after that to focus on the last table, the six, uh, starting with commandment number five. So we'll kind of divvy up our discussion of the Ten Commandments that way. And today I'm doing something of a kind of run-up to it. So we're not going to be looking at any commandment in particular, but sort of an overview, almost philosophically, I guess you'd say, of what the Ten Commandments stand for, especially in the Old Testament and what they have meant to us as Christian people. So with that in mind, I'm not going to read the whole thing again, but I would like to read uh, what's commonly called the first table. So we'll read the first four of the Ten Commandments, and then we'll have some comments really on the entire body of legislation here. So we are in Exodus chapter 20, and we'll start at verse 1. This is the Word of God. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns, for in six days... The Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. So we'll stop there. And uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll go in. Father, we are grateful to you for this remarkable statement of these great, lofty principles of human conduct. We see immediately and we sense in our hearts their deep truth, and we know intuitively that as we conform ourselves to this rule, we live in the place of your blessing, and that as we wander from these, we wander into the place of destruction. We pray that you would once again inculcate into our hearts the depth of the significance of these regulations and that you would help us to in turn be able to pass them to our children and our children's children, so that together we can enjoy the great benefit that comes by living in this place of blessing. We give you thanks for it in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, well, verse 1 here says, 
then God spoke all these words. And that is where I'd like to pause for a moment. It has been traditionally understood and taught by both Jewish and Christian commentators on this text that the intended meaning here is that God spoke this audibly from the mountain. That this is not simply Moses speaking for God, writing this or otherwise conveying it in a mediatorial way to God's people, but that in some sense or other this is to be taken as God actually articulating in an audible way to the masses of his people gathered on the plain below these words. And that in itself has been viewed as putting these somewhat in a class by themselves. You know the Old Testament has a lot of law, has a lot of legislation, a lot of regulations, but somehow it's been understood that when we deal with the Ten Commandments, we're dealing with it with something that is distinct, that is really unique in the great teaching of the Old Testament. And this, together with certain other things about how the Ten Commandments are treated, has led the vast majority of commentators, both from a Jewish and Christian perspective, to agree on this point. The fact that the Ten Commandments are spoken, whereas none of the other law, you see, we never have any indication that God spoke audibly rules about sacrifice or other sorts of <laughs> legislation. The fact that the Ten Commandments is given a special name, it's called the covenant or the testimony, or sometimes called the word, and it applies only to these Ten Commandments. The fact that the Ten Commandments is inscribed by God's finger on tablets of stone, that never is given as a description of other parts of the Old Testament law. The fact that the Ten Commandments is, in, is placed ultimately where? Where does the Ten Commandments wind up? What, what's its location? The Ark. the Ark of the Covenant, which is the holiest object in Israel. It stands for the place, if I can put it this way, of God's most concentrated presence. And the fact that the law is so intimately associated with God's presence becomes the single most dramatic expression of the principle called rule of law, or lex rex, that the law is at the very heart of God's presence. It's not, in other words, they don't put in the ark a little bust of Moses, you know. They don't put in there some other little artifact to stand for a great person. It's not that that's ultimately celebrated. It is God's rule. And we, of course, in our American tradition have made a big deal out of people having equal protection under the law, rule of law. Well, we, if we look in the ancient world for that idea, you pretty much look in vain anywhere earlier than the year 1000, unless you come across the Israelites. They're the ones that seem to have gotten this notion, rule of law. And all of this, centered in the Ten Commandments, has suggested that the Ten Commandments has this kind of special class, special status. Now, having said that, let me expand the thought slightly. Because if we think about the Ten Commandments, the term that is commonly used to describe or refer to this would be the moral law. And so in the Old Testament, we have this idea. It's not called the moral law, but this is a term that's been commonly applied. And then, given the fact that the moral law, the Ten Commandments, seems to be in a class by itself, it immediately implies that we should have some way of referring to other classes of law that we find in the Old Testament. You're probably familiar with this, so let me ask you. The common way to do this would be that there's a threefold delineation of the law that we find in the Old Testament. And I know some of you, maybe most of you, have come across this. Does anyone know what either of the other two would be? The? What do you know? Any takers? Ceremonial. Ceremonial, thank you. And I'm going to put that in the third position. And then middle one, champ, anybody? Okay, then you've got, this goes by various names. I'm going to call it the civil law. I've also heard it called the judicial law. But those three. And as soon as we say that, then, of course, that implies a question, okay, to what extent do any or all of these laws have abiding significance for us from a New Testament point of view? 
And again, I'm trying to represent what I think has been the vast mainstream of understanding of this within Christian tradition. And that would be that we, of course, say along the line there is this great defining moment in human history in the cross of Christ, and that changes everything. So the question is, what change does it effect with respect to these various classes of law? And we'll start at the bottom. The uh, ceremonial law, of course, continues with some adjustments along the way until we get to Christ, and then it stops. That's been the traditional view. So what, what's the ceremonial law? The law of, of, um, of animal sacrifices, you know, the various kinds of program of sacrifice that's mentioned in the book of Leviticus. You've got the trespass offering, you've got the, you know, the fellowship offering, wave offerings, heave offerings, all that. I remember reading that stuff as a kid and thinking, a heave offering, what is that? <laughs> uh, you know, because <laughs> I only knew the word heave only meant one thing to me, you know, but, uh, but uh, anyway... Uh, all of those rather strange kinds of offerings that are described. And if you've read the Old Testament, you know they pop up here and there, and especially in the book of Leviticus, but not exclusively there. We have these references to various kinds of ceremonial practices that are incumbent upon the people of God. It also would extend to distinctions between clean and unclean. So in the Old Testament, we have clean and unclean foods, as you know, giving rise to the kosher regulations in Israel. We have clean and unclean places inside the camp, outside the camp. That distinction is made. We have clean and unclean people. Gentiles, generally speaking, were regarded as unclean, you know. People who had various disease conditions were unclean. And that's a very uh, significant and rather conspicuous part of the Old Testament cultus, Again, going to the book of Leviticus, but uh, mentioned elsewhere. And so we have all of that, very much a part of the observance of the Jewish people, and it's been virtually, I, I say virtually, not, ex not totally, but virtually understood by all Christian people that that ends. When Christ is sacrificed, that's an end to sacrifices, as we see it in the Old Testament. There is no more any kind of shedding of blood. It would be indeed blasphemous to do so. It's disturbing. Uh, you may know that there are some who envision there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple and a reinstitution of animal sacrifices in Jerusalem, and that's a view held by some Christian people. And that just borders on, well, I guess I won't use the epithets I'm really thinking of here, but, you know, to think such a thing after Christ has definitively, you know, com completed all of that, and the New, the New Testament is explicit and emphatic on the point. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly the vast majority of Christian people have understood that. Also, the differentiations with respect to clean and unclean. Jesus in Mark chapter 7 pronounces all foods clean. See, dramatic. That's the text where he says, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. That's what is defiling. Peter has this vision, you recall, in Acts chapter 10. The sheet comes down. There's unclean animals wandering around on the sheet. And a voice from heaven says, eat, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter was about to heave himself at that point, you know. The thought of, Lord, no, I've never had any unclean food cross my lips. He was a Jewish Jew, you know. And the thought of violating kosher in this way was just more than he could tolerate, even though it was God giving that commandment. But, of course, that was only a warm-up, because the real purpose of that vision was not to teach Peter that foods were clean, but to teach Peter that what was clean? Gentiles. Which was even more unthinkable to Peter, that he would go into a Gentile home. Well, you see, all of that in the New Testament, and much more, weighs in to say to us that we could put an exclamation point here and say, that's done. Does that mean we shouldn't study this stuff? Well, certainly not. We should study it a lot because it is, as the New Testament says, types and shadows. It's a rich, textured, 
subtle investigation of all that happened in Christ. And so as we understand it, the better we understand it, the more we appreciate Christ. And all of those offerings have various, give us various windows into the significance of the work of Christ. So we as New Testament Christians should be students of the book of Leviticus. can't believe I'm saying that because that means maybe we should do Leviticus sometime, you know. I'm not sure I'm up for that, but we'll see. Let me see if I can not hang myself here. So anyway, that's the ceremonial. All right, the next uh, class of law, sometimes called civil, sometimes called judicial. I'll go with civil. And the view in the church has been that in some sense it terminates in Christ and in some sense it nevertheless continues. And this is a somewhat more subtle point and I'm hoping I can describe it adequately. Let me start by saying this. The civil law in the Old Testament is that kind of organizational law necessary for a political body to survive. Israel in the Old Testament is not simply a religious community, as you know, but it's a political community. It is a state, and it's a state existing in the context of a family of states, nations, and so on. And insofar as it has that kind of political status, they've got to have things like speed limit laws, you know, they've got to have stuff that has to do with organizing a people in a political sort of way. We're Presbyterians. We have a religious community, but we don't represent a political community. We're not, at least by design, I, I, you know, but it's not, it's not as if we are a political party. We're not, we don't have a, a, a platform in fact, I'll tell you the truth, if you do a survey of this church, or probably even this group in here, we'll find a pretty diverse, you know, set of political outlooks and so on. Um, but, uh, but we have in ancient Israel definitely this kind of political, institutional existence, which requires, in order to operate, some kind of civil law. The civil law in the Old Testament came in the form of what was called casuistry. or so-called casuistic law. Now, it's broader than this, but this will illustrate the point. Casuistry, the root of that is the word case. This is case law. It's distinguished, therefore, from the higher kind, I'll slip this word in here, apodictic. Now, I don't want any eyes glazing over back there. These are good words. They show up in crossword puzzles sometimes. <laughs> Most of you are old enough to remember Groucho Marx. Say the magic word. What was it? A duck dropped down with $50 in its belt? You never know. And apodictic might be the, the word there, you know. I don't know how Groucho would quite get that out of a person. But uh, Anyway, okay, so let's, let's take these two. Apodictic casuistic. Apodictic law is the law of pronouncement. Apodire, or to speak from or speak forth, is the idea of pronouncing law in the sense of statutes. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. By the nature of the case, it is prospective. It says what we should or should not do in the future, you see. Casuistic law is case law. It is, by the nature of the case, retrospective. It examines what has already happened in terms of events in light of apodictic law. We have the very same thing in most of United States jurisprudence here in the state of Washington. If you wanted to go finding apodictic law, where would you look? I don't know. Are there any lawyers in the room? I don't know. You'd go to what are called the RCWs you know, the Revised Code of Washington, which is produced by the state legislature. The state legislature passes laws which are forward-looking, saying from this point on, it'll be legal or not legal to do this or that, you know. Where would we go in our state uh, system of jurisprudence to find casuistry? We'd go to the courts, the judicial branch, which looks at the past. There's a car accident. 
There's a breach of contract, allegedly. There's some event that took place in history, and so we bring the pertinent people into court and have their behavior examined in light of this apodictic law, and we reach conclusions contained in cases. You see. All right, well, you have the same thing in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has that kind of fluidity, and I tell you, this again is a point where Israel was head and shoulders, well, more than that, really almost light years ahead of their contemporaries, where the system by which guilt or innocence was determined would be at bizarre at best. I mean, Hammurabi is sometimes celebrated as this great enlightened spirit, and he was. Under Hammurabi's code, to determine guilt or innocence, I don't want to... See, when I tell this to junior high kids, they love it. <laughs> With this group, you're going to have to kind of brace yourselves. But I, I've actually seen videos portraying, because it's practiced in some parts of the Mesopotamian world to this day. How do you determine guilt or innocence? You get a red-hot fire brand, and you lay it on a person's tongue. And it... And it blisters the tongue, and then a priest examines the blisters to determine whether you're guilty or innocent. That's Hammurabi's methodology. You like that? See? That's that a great light and spirit. Don't you think the Israelites must have looked odd when they came along and said, no, 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 this needs to be adjudicated based on what actually happened, not on some kind of, you know, strange sort of bizarre, uh, you know, appeal to uh, whatever, you know, superstitious uh, kinds of levels of, uh, of observation. Well, casuistry operated this way. It followed the formula, if, then. If such and so happens, then such and so is the result. It is attempting to apply broad principles in particular fact situations. We have an apodictic code, thou shalt not steal. Okay, great broad principle. Casuistic law would say, if your ox crosses into your neighbor's field and eats the grass and tramples the tulips, then, see, if, then, then you shall pay such and so fine or make such and so restitution. It's a very particular application of a broad principle. I mean, to say thou shalt not steal is fine. But does that mean if you steal, you die? Well, no. Casuistry comes along and gives us sort of a particular expression of how that law is to be applied. And then that case becomes precedential, meaning that when events take place in the future, we by analogy reason from what we've already seen to what is the new fact situation. You know. And that's what case law does. Case law doesn't redefine the law, unless you're living after Oliver Wendell Holmes, but that's a different story. But uh, ca you know, casuistry does not redefine the law, but it applies it in the new situations that may come along as societies, you know, sort of progress and so on. The Old Testament has both. So the Old Testament has case law and that comes in the form of these if-then formulas. In fact, if you read any part of chapter 21, the chapter that immediately follows, the one we are in, you'll see casuistry. There is an immediate attempt to give some kind of practical application of the great law of the Ten Commandments. And you'll find that if-then formula again and again. And indeed, the bulk of the law in the Old Testament, I think, at least at this level, would come in that form. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, this, uh, this gives rise to a lot of uh, somewhat subtle distinctions. The Old Testament, uh, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. Well, on the face of it, it leaves it pretty wide open. The Hebrew word there for kill simply means kill. It would apply to killing a flea as much as killing a human being. It's just a broad word. And we might ask, well, how broad is that commandment? Well, casuistry fills in the blanks. It also tells us that there's various, various degrees by which killing may or may not be as serious as another act of killing. And Moses gives the classic example 
of somebody that lies in wait and, you know, leaps out of the bushes and kills somebody with malice aforethought, that's what we call murder one. And that guy's going to, you know, pay probably by execution. But his example is, but if someone goes into the woods and, does anybody know what the example is? It became, it had quite a life. Moses' great example, someone goes into the wood, woods to chop wood. And they're chopping away, and the head flies off the axe handle and flies 50 feet and hits somebody in the head and kills them dead. Same penalty? No! Because, and, and Moses spells it out, he had not hated that person in the past. This wasn't a case of what's called malice aforethought. This was an accident. It may have been negligent. Maybe the guy should have taken a better look at his axe before he went out, so there may be some culpability for the death, but it is not murder one. It's not first-degree murder. It's some, you know, maybe involuntary manslaughter, something like that. We continue to make those same distinctions today. And part of the reason we have made that a big deal in American jurisprudence, and in most of the Western world has been the case, is because of Moses. At the time of the framing of the Constitution, the most important single judicial thinker in the world was William Blackstone. He wrote a four-volume work called Commentaries on the Laws of England. It's a, it's a work on civil law in England, the English common law, and he makes continual appeals to Moses, you see, attempting to show how principles of jurisprudence enshrined in the Bible can be applied in the particular circumstances that he was living in, which was 18th century England. And that's the idea. So that's why I say it continues with the dotted line. The principles continue to be applicable, but we are not trying to recreate ancient political Israel. Nor are we trying to pull up wholesale the laws of ancient Israel and simply drop them in mass on any particular culture. At least that's not been a common approach. Now, you've got two extremes. I don't want to go into too much arcane detail here, but you do have some who have argued that's exactly what we should do. That in any given society, we should be about the business of essentially trying to pull as, as an you know, as, as entire system of law, the law of the Old Testament, and just drop it onto any given culture today, that that should be the ambition. That's called theocracy. And there are people running around who are theocrats, who really argue from a Christian point of view that's what we should be trying to do. I am not one of them. I just want you to know that that view is out there. There are others who say the civil law in the Old Testament has no application whatsoever. We should ignore it. We should not have any reference to it whatsoever if we are in any kind of political office, you know, these days. Those are the two extremes. The church in the main has been in a balanced position, representing something like this. If you're a Christian legislator, you know, you're elected senator, that'd be great, actually. I would support you. Any of you in this room, you want to run for senator, I will support you. I will endorse you, you know, for whatever that's worth. That may be the kiss of death, but uh, nevertheless... Uh, uh, if you become a senator and you're saying, okay, here I'm a Christian and I'm a senator, what should I do with my Bible? Well, the traditional Christian answer has been, you should study your Bible and you should become familiar with the wisdom of the way in which God guided his ancient people and draw from it principles that may apply as you're thinking about particular bills that are being proposed in your senatorial office. You shouldn't be looking on the one hand to just, you know, start dropping Bible verses on all the legislation, nor should you on the other hand just be ignoring it. You should be advised or informed by it. And so that's kind of the point of that dotted line. Does that make sense? That that's, that's, the, that's been the view. I think it's a correct view. It's the uh, traditional view that, that seems to have been, uh, in the main, representative of Christian history. It would certainly be the view you'd find, for example, in Thomas Aquinas from a Catholic point of view, and you'd find something like it in John Calvin from a Protestant point of view. This is not a uniquely Protestant or Catholic uh, outlook. All right, so that's the civil code. Then the moral code, referring to the Ten Commandments, has been understood as continuing with no break whatsoever. 
that the moral code is not only not abrogated by Christ, it is reinforced by Christ. That when Jesus addresses the content of the Ten Commandments, there's no sense in which he is trying to get us to ignore it, but in fact he gives it another great boost. The, in some ways the Sermon on the Mount would be an example of that. The one point that needs further discussion on that, which I'm not going to do right now, but I'll just mention it, is of course the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the fourth commandment, does not continue at least in the same form as we find in the Old Testament. We've talked about this before, we'll mention it briefly again next week, but the, the whole view seems to be that the Sabbath continues, but it continues with substantial revisions based on what Christ brings in his work of redemption. So instead of a day of holy rest, we have a day of holy labor. That's part of Jesus' teaching. Instead of observing a Saturday day of rest, you know, Jesus does rest on the Sabbath. That's the day that he's in the tomb. But holy activity, he rises from the dead on Sunday. And then we have repeated references to the first day of the week throughout the rest of the New Testament, seeming to at least strongly suggest to Christian people then and to Christian history that there's a new understanding of the Sabbath that seems at least to point towards Sunday more than Saturday, although not without any, not, well, not with great explicit force. Uh, but that in any event, the understanding of the Sabbath changes. But it doesn't stop. We don't cease to have any interest in the Sabbath. It is revised, but even that continues. And certainly the requirements about killing, stealing, committing adultery, etc., all of those without any uh, uh, abrogation whatsoever. I mean, they just continue even more full force in the New Testament. Paul asked the question in Romans 3.31 with respect to the significance of faith for justification. He raises the question, do we destroy the law by our faith? Answer, no. We establish the law. Paul's understanding is that this is the first time, really, that the law could be fully realized in the human experience by virtue of the work of Christ. A point I might mention that Dr. Liesma was pointing out to me right after class last Sunday. Remember Herm? So, you know, I made a note and said, I'm going to mention that this week, and I'm going to give you credit because uh, he felt like that was a little bit absent last week. That faith is the thing that finally gives us the ability to do what the moral law required in a way that was not possible before. And so that's, uh, uh, you know, it just, it continues uh, even more. All right, <clears throat> so that's a little bit of an uh, overview of Old Testament law, and I think I'm representing here what has been at least uh, a mainstream view. When we look at the Ten Commandments themselves, when we look at, uh, do I have an, yeah, I do. I'm going to fix this a little bit. When we look at the content of the Ten Commandments, of course, one of the most famous things we notice immediately about them is what's commonly called the two tablets. We never are told, to my knowledge, now you may, if you know the verse, point it out to me and I'll fix this, but we're never told directly that the first tablet was the first four commands and the last tablet was the last six, but it's so strongly suggested and has been universally taken to be the case that I'm just assuming that for purposes of our present discussion. The first tablet would therefore be our duties to God, and we might say, if I can kind of use my same little symbol here, that that represents then our vertical responsibilities. These are the things that we do toward God. And then the last six represent our horizontal duties. And I wish I could say that I dreamed this up, but this has been a common Christian understanding that we see, in a sense, even in the Ten Commandments, impliedly the cross. That you've got vertical duties and horizontal duties, and the cross itself seems to capture something of that in a, in a, uh, in a way that uh, is reflected here and elsewhere. So the first four commandments tell us what we should do in our duties toward God. What are we to do? Well, there's four things. The first has to do with the question of who we should worship. So we're told in the first commandment, 
thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the common way it's rendered. I've actually heard people argue, oh, you see, the ancient Israelites were polytheists. It was later revision that represents their monotheism, because look at the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. All, all Yahweh is demanding is he, that he be the first one on the list. Oh, give me a break. What? A, you know, I mean, I've heard people with PhDs make that argument. Come on! You know, what is this? No, no, no. The, the Hebrew expression there, thou shalt have no other gods before me, literally the Hebrew reads, before my face. You shall have no other gods before my face. Now that in itself should be sufficient explanation, you know, but, but of course that's a, that in itself is, a, is an idiom for in my presence. To be before the face of someone is to be in their presence. And so that would be a better way of rendering it in, in terms of the sense of it. Thou shalt have no other gods in my presence. All right, from the Jewish point of view, how far does the presence of God extend? You know, where can I go? The psalmist says to flee from your presence. I take the wings of the morning, fly to the most part of this. There you are. I can't get away from you. God is there, coextensive with his universe. And of course, the entire understanding of the Old Testament is that this command is that this is, there's, there is one and only one God, and that is the one who is to be worshipped, and that there is no other uh, that can be put in that category. The ancient Israelites were not polytheistic, and hopefully we are not. There's a great theological benefit from this, because if we worship that which is not truly God, then we are idolaters, and that's a serious sin for which there are serious penalties. But there are also great psychological benefits from it, because... If a person is a polytheist personally, you can't help being a little schizophrenic, can you? You know? Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. And if you've got two gods, you have a problem. Because the fact that you have two gods immediately implies those gods don't get along. And if, you, if they don't get along, you don't get along with yourself. And you're always having to love one and despise the other, serve one, reject the other. You're always caught in this fragmentation within your own person. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his deeds. And that is the root of double-mindedness. It is the root of double-mindedness to have two gods, let alone six or seven. What do you do? Take a vote? Among your deities? How do you work that out, you know? And that is the, maybe one of the most crippling things a person can find himself or herself living with emotionally, is competing deities. Devotion to this, devotion to that. One of the nice things about having just one God is it really simplifies your life. You have one object of worship. And I mean object of worship. This God stands in the place such that you say to this one day by day, you are my Lord, my King, my deity. You are the absolute sovereign of my life. I make no claim to myself aside from what you've already made to me. You are the one to whom I surrender everything that I have. Life, health, you name it, it's yours. My life at that point is singular. Singular. Then every other blessing God gives falls in its proper place marriage blessings, financial blessings, losses, gains, they all kind of fall into perspective. But when we attach ourselves like it's a deity to something, then the upset is almost incalculable. If that applies to us individually, how much does it apply corporately? When a society is possessed of multiple deities, then the same conflict that can take place personally then takes place in sort of cold civil wars going on in the culture. You know, in American culture, we've got multiple deities. You've got people running around just giving themselves to all kinds of diverse, you know, objects of worship. So one person runs down the sidewalk with save the whales, you know, and somebody else runs down the sidewalk with something else, you know, global warming, I don't know, you name it, it's out there. And all these people give ultimate loyalty to something 
And then we find ourselves in a very difficult position trying to get along with each other because we're worshiping different gods that don't get along, you know. And how much calm it brings to a culture to finally recognize just one God. This has been true even for cultures that have worshipped the wrong God. Just the worship of one God does them some good. Now, it doesn't do them a lot of good. And sometimes it can lead them into gross, horrific crimes. I think you could say there was a time in Nazis, Nazi history when they had one God, but it's a very tragic God, you know. What if it's the right God? And a culture will say in a kind of consensus of conviction, this is the one. This is the God that we worship. How much peace does it bring internally? I'm all, to be honest, I'm all for saving the whales, you know. I personally think it's only a Christian who can give a good theological, philosophical apologetic for saving the whales, you know, because they are created by the one true God, and he cares about whales. And so I can, without worshiping that cause, at the same time, find a place in the panoply of interest that I have for that concern. That's, that's really what comes as a great benefit, isn't it, of having one God. The next commandment, how? This is sometimes confusing. This group is so sophisticated that you get this. I don't even have to say it. But somebody may be listening on tape someday that doesn't know this, so I'm saying it for their benefit, not for yours. There is a difference between the first commandment and the second one. The first commandment says no idols. The second commandment says no graven images. I'm, by the way, disappointed that the NRSV, which generally is pretty good, leaves out that phrase graven images. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol, and that almost makes it sound synonymous with commandment number one, doesn't it? And sometimes people read the two and they think, well, what's the difference? No other gods, no idols, same thing. No, there is a difference. The implication of commandment number two is even if you are worshiping the one true God, you still need to worship that one true God the one right way. This is not cafeteria practice. We don't worship the God the way we want. He tells us how he wants to be worshiped, and that's what we need to do. I say, oh, well, you know, I want to worship the one true God, but I'd really like to worship the one true God by making a golden calf. I mean, you know, what's up, what's wrong with that? And, I'm, and, and that's what they did. You know that, chapter 33 of Exodus. What was the name that they gave to the calf? The name they gave to the calf was Yahweh. And they said to the people, this is Yahweh, this is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That was their sort of introductory language. They thought, what's the problem? We're worshiping the right God. We just, it helps us a little bit to have this, this artifact. Does God like that? Not so much. I think part of the great genius of our creation, the part of what God has implanted in us, is this creative spark. We all love to create. We all do. I have little things that I like to create. My wife is a wonderfully creative person. She creates beauty. I tell you, she creates beauty. You know. Sometimes I look at my living room, and I just think, what am I doing living in a beautiful place like this? Look at this. Beautiful. Look out in the backyard, flowers growing. It's beautiful. That's a little bit of the image of God at work, isn't it? And, you know, those of you in this room that like to be creative, you paint, you quilt, whatever it might be. You are, and don't, God, is crea God is a creator, and he's planted in us this desire to create. Now, we would have thought it would be the, heart, the height of folly if God had created the universe and then bowed down to worship his own creation. What a strange bizarre thing that the God of the universe would create something out of nothing and then worship it. But that's the insanity that is reflected by 
this, per, this perversion of art into objects of worship. What does it do? It takes that which is completely under our dominion and makes it an object of worship so that, you might say, we can take the God of the universe and put him under our dominion. It's really a way of domesticating God. If I can reduce God to a graven image, then I can control God in some sense through that image. I can put a leash on him. I can establish some kind of quid pro quo religion with him. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. I can move this God. I can make this God my slave. And inevitably, the creation of, go of, of images for the purpose of worship has something like that going on, a way of trying to bring the God of the universe, the Lord God Almighty, under my dominion. God will not have it. No, he doesn't want us to take anything we've created and transform it into an object of worship as if we could grab him by the neck and bring him down and, and place him in that thing, you know. So we are bound to worship a God we cannot see. So this is really a matter of not so much who we worship, but how we worship the God we know. And so it's a who and a how. The third one, I'll have to make real quick work of this, the third one has to do with the language of worship. You know. Now, I couldn't come up with a good, cool word to use here. So if you can come up with one, I'd like that. Um, but the point is, don't use God's name in a trivial fashion. Words are the other great aspect of our human creation. We are creative, you know. God, would, God told Adam, till the... Garden, make it beautiful, extend its beauty. But he also gave him the responsibility to name the animals. That capacity to use words, as far as we know, is, is not shared by any other created you know, animal on this planet. Uh, anything like what we can do, the subtlety of the use of words. But of course, the words are not only reflective of the human mind, they're reflective of the human heart. It's out of the heart that the mouth speaks, Jesus says. And so we need to be careful of our words because they reflect the heart. And in some ways, the heart and the mouth are connected. And it's very difficult to conceal. I try to not be political in here, and I'm not saying this to be political, but I'm betting if I could you know, have a five-minute conversation with each of you and you didn't know up front what it was about... And I just tried, tried to get each of you to say the name Barack Obama five or six times in a conversation. I could guess your politics based on just how you say the name. Isn't it true? Isn't it hard when you really dislike someone or you really like someone? Either way, I'm not trying to be political. You know, I realize we have diverse opinions here. But the point is, how you say a name will somehow reflect the state of the heart. It's really hard to use, to have affection in the way you say the name of someone you despise, or vice versa. Isn't it true? And God wants us to keep an eye on that, because when we use the name of God trivially, people run around, oh my God, what is this? Even that is a reference to the Lord God Almighty, and it's just thrown out like it's nothing. What? You see let alone saying the name Jesus Christ. How many times have I heard that? I want to just go up to someone and say, you realize this is the person that I've devoted my life to, and I worship day in and day out, that you've just disparagingly referred to as if it were trash. Well, I haven't done that very frequently. I've done it once or twice in my life and got very interesting responses. But, you know, isn't it true? Be careful how we say the name. And then the final one, of course, is the when of worship. While we are to be worshipers all the time, God organizes our lives such that there are times in which we especially devote ourselves in a singular kind of way to worship. And that that's healthy for us. You know, I can worship God on the golf course. Actually, I rarely have. I, um, <laughs> 
those rare times when I've gone on the golf course, it has not been an act of worship. It has done, in fact, nothing for my Christian sanctification at all. It's been a big setback, you know, so... But maybe you can worship God on the golf course. But on Sunday morning, that's not the place to be worshiping God. God has organized our lives so that there's a time of worship when that is expressly what we're doing. And that's part of what the Sabbath is about, isn't it? And we have that same kind of rhythm to life in which we have times that we're together to think specifically about the things of God, to worship Him, to renew our devotion to Him. And these taken together make a wonderful kind of uh, principle of devotion to God, which gives rise to, then, and legitimizes our appreciation and service to others. It's recognizing the dignity and the majesty of God that gives me a basis, a foundation upon which I can recognize the dignity of my neighbor, who's made in God's image, and give that person the respect that they deserve. So I'll stop right there. Uh, I want to come back and pick up a few little loose ends, especially Sabbath. And maybe if you can come up with a word to go in that blank, I'd appreciate that. But we'll um, come back to some of these themes next week. Herm, please. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll call it a morning. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you that you have given us light. And we think of this that has been such a beacon of light, your Ten Commandments, how much wisdom... How much help comes to us through these great principles of human conduct. We pray that even our brief review of some of them this morning would cause them to be more deeply inculcated in each of our hearts, our consciences, so that we can be more properly informed as to the life that you call us to live. We thank you for all of these things and for our time together this morning in the name of Christ. Amen.